Good morning, everyone, and welcome. My name's Robin Ewing, and with Professor Michael Anderson, I co-direct the CREATE Centre, Creativity in Research, Engaging the Arts, Transforming Education, Health and Wellbeing. We're in for a wonderfully interesting session this morning. But before I introduce Laura, let me start by acknowledging our First Nations Australians. Uh, I'm on Darug country today, but the university is on Gadigal country. And let me acknowledge um, that this land was never ceded, always was, always will be Aboriginal land. Let me also acknowledge that the, that the arts and story are always at the centre of First Nations people's doing, knowing, being, becoming. And I do believe we have so much to offer, uh, so much to learn from the way that they do things. Um, if you haven't yet joined CREATE, please think about it. I know that Anna will put it in the chat. You might also like to acknowledge where you're joining from in the chat. Um, let me now introduce Laura McBain, who is joining us today from California. Laura is co-managing director of Stanford D School. I think she'll probably explain the D. Um, and the K-12 lab co-director of Hasso Platner Institute of Design. Laura, your, your title today, Enhancing Imagination and Creativity Through Generative AI, and your first sentence there, what if AI is not the en en enemy, I know will be so interesting. Thank you so much for joining us today and over to you. Oh, welcome. Uh, thank you. That was lovely, Robin. And for those who I'm, I'm seeing on the screen and no faces, Pam, thanks for putting your video on. Um, it, welcome. It is about four o'clock in, in Palo Alto, um, where I live here. Um, and I am part of the, the Stanford University. Um, I work at the D School. And um, yeah, as we get started, I'm just very grateful for everyone who has showed up. Um, if we think about an acknowledgement of the country, um, Stanford University sits on the Alani um, territories and tribes, and it's a long history with the Stanford um, Sustainability School and Stanford bit large that we actually um, live on that land and actually are quite grateful to the tribe and continue to stay connected. So thank you for the acknowledgement of country as well. It's something I was saying that like, I don't think the US does as well as you all do uh, um, in that particular area. So I'm gonna share my screen and we're gonna get started. And if you are just coming into this webinar, um, welcome, good morning or good evening in my case. Um, there, I will be sharing a lot of information um, and jumping in. Um, as I was telling Robin and Anna, typically I run a lot of workshops. We're making, we're doing, we're building. And we I intentionally designed this more of a webinar where you can engage in the chat as a conversation. And so if you're just with screen off, that's lovely. No problem, no need to put the screen on. Um, if you are, it's great to see your faces. Thanks, Helen, Julie, and Cam. Great to see your faces. Uh, but if you do uh, want to put your camera on, feel free. But if you are like many educators, this is one of the many things you're multitasking right now. That's lovely. Um, I will have a few prompts in the chat as we go, but feel free to continue to ask questions as we go. I think Robin will be my co-pilot, right, Robin? So if, if questions come up, feel free to put them in the chats. Um, I am an educator um, and a practitioner. As Robin said, I am the managing director of the D School and also the K-12 coach, um, K K-12, the director of the K-12 lab at the D-School. Sorry, it's a long day. Um, and, um, but I've spent all my lifetime working with educators in schools. Um, I started my career as an educator on the border of San Diego and Mexico, teaching at a comprehensive high school um, with about 3,600 students. So I start, and this was back, way back when, um, pre-iPhone. Uh, and started teaching back then. I was an English teacher. I was an English as second language teacher and a history teacher. Um, I eventually left that school, gave up my tenure as a teacher, which is a weird thing to do in the United States. Like you're supposed to stay in your school for the 30 years and never leave. Um, 
but I, I left that school um, and became a co-founding teacher of a school called Hai Takai, which is a school in Southern California that teaches project-based learning. Um, and has been kind of written up and renowned as one of the leaders in project-based experiential and an area where we mix creativity throughout every subject, math and art, science and food, uh, bread making, kitchen ovens in our classrooms and humanities, the act of making and creation um, so that students can actually flex or, or really grapple with their own sense of what it means to be creative. Um, and then I eventually uh, left there most of last five or six years ago and now manage the D school. And a lot of my work now um, at, that we'll get into in a minute is really at the intersection of creativity, design, technology, and humanity. Um, I'm really obsessed as being a human-centered designer, which means having a responsibility to the things that we make, to the people and to the planet that we thrive and coexist with. And so a lot of the work that we're going to jump into today is a sampling. Uh, anyone who remembers old school discs, it's a sample. It's not the full album. Uh, this is just a piece of it that you can dive into. Know that there's a full record. There's a full record store of more resources. And everything that I'm sharing with you all today, um, there'll be QR codes. There's links on our website. There are things that are open source. So really make sure that we really feel that our job is to create resources for the world as well as teach our students. So I hope that makes sense. And, um, you know, we'll do a little jump in and get started. Uh, we'll see if the screen share works. We'll find out as we go, um, see what happens. So I'll just kind of jump in here. Um, and I would just love, as we put in here, as, as Robin said, if you could just help me out a little bit, um, I would love to know who's in the room right now. Um, so if you have 30 seconds, just put your name, where you're from, and um, you know what you teach, that would be helpful just so I know my audience. If you have a minute, that would be wonderful. And just put your name in there. Oh, great, Lauren, to let me know a lot of folks from Deloitte, great human-centered place. We know some folks there. All right. And we have folks from other places. I love that, different, not a teacher. I love it. Well, we'll play with all these things. This is great. Um, all right, so we're gonna get right going and feel free to keep adding. Thanks, Paul, keep putting your name in there. and. You know, folks who come in late, Robin, maybe you can encourage folks to keep adding this as we go um, along the way. So welcome, everybody. Um, so we're going to jump into this title, which is like really enhancing imagination and creativity through generative AI. Um, and people love generative AI. It's like happening everywhere. So I just want to share a little bit about the D school before we get started. Um, so I work at the Stanford, the Hassel Plattner Institute of Design formally or affectionately known as the D school or the design school. Uh, and our really ultimate mission is to unlock the creative confidence for young people to take on challenges in the world. And when I refer to young people, um, I'm talking about young people of any age, right? From professional learners, undergrad students, um, master students. And we do that in a lot of ways. And we've been around since about 2005. And as someone put in the chat, we are human-centered designers. And so we really unlock um, creative potential, but really use design as a way for people to build their imagination, build their writing skills, build their making skills, but really remind them that they all have the capacity to be creative. And that's a, one of our core missions within the D School. Um, and so as we get into ChatGPT today, I wanna play a little game to get us started. And we at the D School play this game, how are you feeling, really? And some folks, we, so I'm improvising here, and I would love for people to put in the chat, how are you feeling about ChatGPT, really? Um, and you can only use an emoticon, though, in this thing. Yep, I love it. Robin's like, eyeballs, you can put in the chat. You can put, it'd be great if you can put in the chat. You can add it right in there. If you don't know where the emoticon is down in the chat thing, there's a little tiny circle, and you can kind of, you know, just put, grab one. There's many different options there. So I would love to hear how people are feeling about ChatGPT right now, really. Great, I love them. Thumbs up. Alex, I'm loving the, like, okay, do I feel older now? I absolutely do feel the, the Anna, I love that. The Dan on fire, brain, I feel that way a lot when I see a lot of the things that are coming up. Love it, we see a lot of sunshine. Wonderful. And I, I say that, I, I, and this is a light question, but I say that with some intentionality, um, 
as a designer that how we feel about things impacts how we design with it. The more fearful we are, right? In some ways, the more risk averse we are. The more excited, sometimes we align into it. And so as a designer, I'm really cautious about my emotions connected to learning. I mean, one thing that I know of being a K-12 teacher and working with folks is that learning is an evocative state. It is supposed to bring emotions, joy, frustration, happiness, sadness. Those are part of the learning experience. And so when we see new technologies, we often will say, I'm overwhelmed. I'm exhausted. This is too much. Those are emotions. So how, getting in touch with those as we go through um, is really important because it influences the decisions and the actions that we take. And, you know, sometimes, and I've known this Australia, uh, Australian folks are like, why are you talking about our emotions? <laughs> um, it's one of those things, particularly in design. And so I thank you for jumping in and like, you know, messing with that first emoticon, because it's important for us to recognize those and not to be um, overwhelmed by those, but actually just know and have some awareness about how we're feeling about this type of work and how that is influencing us as we go forward. So we're going to keep rolling um, here. And I just want to do this as um, just a, like a level setting about what is generative AI. This is not a CS 101 course. We are not coding here. Um, and so if you feel like you're getting a lecture on CS, this is not it. Um, I do not consider myself a coder, although I do consider myself a technologist. And so just a little precursor for those to level set some stuff. Um, we for historically for the last what 15, 50 years, we've been talking about general AI binary, the capacity to predict, perceive, and classify, binary, zero ones. Um, and now we've moved into this crazy space, which is generative AI, right? The capacity to generate new things based on pre-trained language models, create content. And all of us are saying different things. There's BARD that's popping up, ChatGPT, which launched in November, DALI, music, as you see. So a lot of things are coming up and we continue to see new things. Um, and so we think about GTP, just GPT itself, we're talking about generative pre-trained transformers. We're taking things, models or data or language, that's a data set, right? That's been pre-trained on how to respond and creating new content. It's creating something. And that is the rub, I think for many of us, <laughs> particularly creatives who are like, wait a second, is ChatGPT more creative than me? Sometimes I would say yes, and sometimes I would say maybe be not. This is the heart of the question or the intersect is like, how is it actually helping me, enhancing, or in fact, hindering my capacity to think, to comprehend, to create? And those are valid questions to ask. If you're working with young people, sometimes the messiness of learning, right, is in the creation of something not because you're producing an asset or an artifact, but in the process of making, we understand. And so one thing that I will say, as we've started to learn within the D school and beyond, is like, this stuff's not going away, y'all. It's not going anywhere. <laughs> so we have, we have to wrestle with our emotions on that, understand the dialogue or the conflict around this work, and then think about how do we actually have this stuff not control us, how do we actually get to shape it? And how do we actually to use it to enhance our life? Um, I was When I was at South by Southwest um, last summer, or last spring actually, um, John Maida, who's a great designer at MIT, he talked about um, AI and language models. And we have a choice, he said, which I loved, which is we can use AI to do our laundry or make cookies. <laughs> That's a design choice. What do we want to use it for? It is a tool and a skill and we can decide how we want to use it. And that I think for all of us who are making things, creative things, is what are the best ways to use it? What do we want to prototype? What do we want to make? And what do we want to learn with it alongside of it? And not on this presentation, but we are seeing now constantly um, this whole idea that we are seeing digital workers pop up. We're augmenting, I've heard that a lot, augmenting ourselves through AI. What does that look like? And if anyone in this call is concerned with um, the, the future of learning, for example, or the future of work, the question that I think that I'm wrestling with a lot is how do we ensure that every young person of any age, again, 
has the capacity to be augmented with AI and learn to make with it, not to be afraid of it. We are seeing a massive gap already between who has access to this, who wants to use it and who doesn't. And if we look 50 years or 30 years out, we're seeing the creation, maybe not even 30 years out, we're seeing the creation of digital workers. That's the thing. So how do we help students know how to make with them and create with them? That's a skill set that's coming and becoming a thing. So how do we do that? So I just want to like start with this section or this like segment, which is AI did what now? <laughs> uh, because it's fastly changing all the time. As Cam put, it's changing as bad as ever. I just want to do a few highlights that I just think are kind of like really wild. You're like, really? And then they kind of park at like, wow, how is this happening? Um, so this first one, um, and you're seeing some of my own images here, you know, mid journey, if you haven't made with this, I encourage you to do so it's, it's, that's created on discord. This is just their showcase. You see a lot of wild stuff on here. Um, it's a capacity to make images. Uh, there's an argument of creatives that it's getting too AI like it doesn't have the messiness of the human hand. There's a whole argument on that. If you're following that conversation, um, this was the one I did over the summer when I asked AI to describe a student in the future impacted by climate change. That's all I wrote. And this is what it gave me. And I was struck by not only obviously the clarity of the image, the crispness, but like the intersection of what was happening in the world behind the student and what that suggests about the signals or the data sets that the AI is seeing when we think about climate and pollution. And this idea of like having a student, um, you know, being augmented a little bit by some, some, you know, technology on their face or whatever through spec around, you know, different issues around health. And so those are the questions you get to raise with that. Um, another area that's like super funny and cute, but is like make a video. Facebook is coming up with this, or sorry, excuse me, Meta, they're down the street, but Meta's got a thing here, which is like making videos. You can turn that into us. And this one, very simple. A dog, you type in and a dog wearing a superhero outfit with a red cape flying through the sky. That's how quick these come up. And we're talking 30 seconds. Again, something our students can do. How do they make videos with AI? What do they want to create? Um, this one that's also, yeah, I don't know if anyone tracked this this summer. Yep, I see a handful. That is wild to me. Again, pre-trained data sets using John Lennon's voice as a data set to create a new Beatles song. They say it's coming out this fall. And is that really what we want? I don't know. I am. But at the same time, I am very curious what the song will be. I want to hear what it is and I want to listen to it because I know it'll be interesting. So what's happening there? And perhaps most recently, the thing that's really interesting is this group called Replica. Um, you can Google them really quickly. Um, there are AI replicas for mental health and for companionship and for friendship that's being launched. I was playing with mine the other day trying to build it and build the data set about the facts. We're seeing this as an onslaught, um, but it really is around AI for loneliness. So can that be used as a way to help young people who are feeling with loneliness? These are questions, you know, these are not answers that I'm proposing, but this is what's happening, right? We're seeing these different scale, you know, from questions of like having it make something like this, as Cam said, to something like this. The implications are radically different. You know, as Kim said, if this is bad as AI will ever be, I'm not sure if this is it, but this is a question that we all need to wrestle with. So I'm kind of curious. I just threw out a few examples. I'm kind of curious of like what you all have seen. What's the wildest, you know, thing as Cam wrote in the past? What is the thing as bad as it will ever be? I'm curious what examples you have seen within the Australian context that you're seeing. I see some folks from Deloitte in the room. How are you using that? Thanks. Thanks, Dan, for dropping some stuff in there. I'm seeing AI-powered assistants. I'm curious, again, what you have seen. I'll give you like about 30 seconds. Just, just like throw some ideas in the chat. AI for grief, yeah. I've seen that pop up too. Yep, I've seen that one, making their homework better. I've seen people using it to improve their writing, for example. That's a huge one. Sometimes that's particularly helpful for young people who are learning in the English language, for example. Meeting minutes, um, that has been a big debate. Thanks, Catherine, for sharing. I think it's called read.ai. I don't know if that's the one you've seen. Um, 
that is one that's come up with our context as well. Uh, we're still in the debate of whether we want to use that as well. So that is a question as whether we want something like that. Yeah, that's an interesting one. Oh, I love that play with taste and flavor development. That's fascinating. Yeah. All right, so we'll keep going. Feel free to throw some stuff in there. AI generated music, I'm playing with that. Use ideas, love it. So I just wanna share a little bit um, this question. Again, understanding of like, particularly on education, what's happening in this space um, already. And so this question all of us are playing with is like, you know, how my AI like reimagine or redesign education? Because ideally, in my opinion, education is in the creative business <laughs> as well as it should be. So how do we think about that? And so, and at the same time, I want to share a little bit about how we think about design in particular. And so I'll share this question, which is like, it's not how might, it's how is it already happening when it is. We all know that. Um, and so when I share a design, this is how we think about design at the D school is that design is not the, just the creation of something like this, which we all know that one. Um, it's not just the hexagon models, if you're familiar with that. Um, it actually is a layered piece when we think about the design of data, the line of tech, and AI is one of them, the design of products, physical and, and, and digital, experiences, of course, systems, and this question of um, implications. All of these are design choices. And as Cam said, this is the space when they as bad as it ever was. The opportunity space for creators and designers is decide where we want to design. Where is the space for creative problem solving, creative thinking in the design space of making with AI? That's the question. Where do we play? Not everything has to be an app. So where do we want to play in this spaces? Um, and so I just share that like we know AI as an emerging technology. And I'll headline here that within the D school. Emerging AI is just one of the technologies that we're working on right now. We're working on gene editing, making that more transferable, blockchain, and a few others. Um, but AI is analyzing data in really rapid ways. My colleague, Kawaku Anang, shared this new site with me, which is called Readocracy, that basically looks at um, misinformation and using AI language models or machine learning algorithms, and I'll get into that too, to actually analyze the consumption of what you read online. Looking at your biases about, are you reading stuff that's accurate? Misinformation. And it creates data sets like this by people. Looking at what you're reading, but also the quality of what you're reading. So when I think about young people, for example, we, anyone who's done leaders, literacy stuff or working on like, how do we combat misinformation? Can AI help us do that? Can it help us understand our embedded biases when we're reading stuff online, when my mom sends me something from like News Fox or something versus when I'm reading something from the BBC? How do we understand that? And can we get can we use AI or machine learning algorithms to help us actually quantify that in unique ways? But that gives us real information about how we're consuming content and what we need to not be doing. So that's, that, that to me is a really interesting application for any of us who are thinking about misinformation on the internet. And I've been playing with this one and I think it's kind of fascinating. Um, you know, AI is designing products, as we know. If um, this is one, probably not too surprising, but, you know, ConLab and Saul Khan's group, um, you know, are creating AI tutors. And that's an interesting application as well because we're seeing the capacity for differentiation in the learning. I'm not an advocate that like AI will replace the teacher I, as a project-based, creative, hands-on maker teacher. I think there's great value in that experience and I would continue to advocate for that. And at the same time, if you are differentiating instruction for a whole range of people, we need to find ways and new ways to actually make sure young people have different content specificities as ways to differentiate for that. We are a diverse culture, we are diverse people, and our students learn in different ways. So can we find tutors or AI tutors like this one or others that are doing that type of work, right? Not to um, replace teachers in the classroom, but to augment, right, the learning experiences that they're creating. Um, this one I threw out for y'all. Uh, it's our folks from Melbourne. If you haven't seen this, they've been doing some really cool stuff. Um, anyone in classrooms or even our folks in Deloitte 
the capacity for like mid journey um, to prototype. You know, we're trying to make prototypes. You're creating, whether it's a theater space, Anna was talking about like, and before y'all got on the call, a really cool exhibition that's happening on the Tempest, right? I think that's what you said. Um, can you use AI to create like a theater experience? What that visually could look like? You can. And does that get you faster to what you actually want to create? Right? And, and giving you that visual space so that you're not spending time in AutoCAD, really worried about what it could look like. Can you actually get the feel and create five prototypes in five minutes? about what you're trying to create. That to me is a great value because it moves your work faster, not because you're going to replicate this model, but it gives you inspiration for what's possible. You as the designer of these things, of these products, make the decisions. AI is giving us the possibilities. Um, and then for me, you know, speaking of the classroom piece, I've been inspired by this, this group and many others like this that are like designing curriculum. Um, they, and I just pulled up, they have lots of different ones, but like they design project-based learning experiences that you can customize, play with, um, as someone who has helped people, um, you know, teach, learn how to do design thinking and project-based learning and frame up classroom challenges, for example, like usually that some of that design work is over the summer. Sometimes you're like late at night, sometimes it's friends and colleagues you're trying to figure something out. Why not augment some of your teaching lesson plan with AI and see what it might create? Not because the AI is teaching the students, but it can help us get faster about what else might we do? How do I build a project-based learning experience that's gonna last six weeks that meets some of these things? And I can do it in five minutes, right? Activating or augmenting some of our work. Um, and then this last one, I think is all the question we're wrestling with is like this question of systems. You know, AI is a system. We're seeing lots of evidence of this. And I, I put this on there because I'm noticing when we think about AI as a system, it is an opportunity space to reimagine the system. Full stop. You know, I think early days last year, we had conversations with open AI, we had conversation classroom and the conversation was like, it will it cheat? Like, is it gonna help us do better at cheating? And the conversation was circled around there or plagiarism. And if you've noticed and following the conversation, it has shifted from less from cheating but how do I use it to do something? Even Cam was saying, I use it with my students. Can I use it in new ways? It's already changing the system. And again, this is where our human knowledge comes in. What systems do we wanna change? <laughs> what should be changed? What needs to be retired? And how can we use AI and other technologies to help us do that? And then this last one, again, these are all design choices, is implications. A lot of what we've been talking about today is implications. Um, and this one is probably the one that I find most profound. It gets at mental health, but I put the QR code because I think it's worth a listen. Um, and I see Dan saying, shaking his head, like Esther Perel is amazing. <laughs> um, and her South by talk last year was looking at the new AI, which is artificial intimacy. Replica is an example of that, but how do we ensure that as we're creating these digital tools, we're not replacing digital tools and supplanting that what we call like actually assuming that it's intimacy, that is real connection. How do we distinguish between the two? And as a designer, I feel like that is one of the most profound questions is like, what does it mean to be human? What does it mean to connect? What does it mean to really see someone? What does it mean to have empathy? And there are certain tools we know AI can do and there's probably things that it can't do. We do know from like evidence and we've seen research for like PTSD patients, for example, having an AI mental health coach has been quite helpful because there's no judgment. However, you know, um, one of the things that I love about Esther Perel's work in particular is that AI uh, may not have an opinion. <laughs> they may not have as many emotions. Uh, and so sometimes human relationships are as not as simple as binary uh, questions. They're much more nuanced than that. They are actually not um, linear. They often are actually contradictory sometimes, <laughs> uh, and rightfully so. So that is what they do. That is means to be human. And so having the two realities or multiple truths, if you will is a question for creatives. And we all deal with that in creative space. It's like having multiple truths and how do we deal with that? So I just wanted to share what I'm noticing again about the scan and all of these are again, all design opportunities. You know, whether you're, you're working at Deloitte here, you're in a classroom space. The question I always think about is where do we get to create with AI across the design landscape? Knowing that like probably data is probably the single most area that we always wanna pay attention to as well as the implications. 
and of course in between, but the data that we choose indicates the stuff that's going to come up. So if you have a biased data set, we will create a bias implication. So being really mindful about how we choose as creatives and how designers, the input and the output of what we're creating. And we actually have power over that. Right? We actually get to have agency over this. We are designers. We are all technologists. We are all makers on this call. And so we get to decide where we want to play. We don't have to be reactive to it or be victims of it. We get to shape it. And so what I wanted to share with you all um, is how we are kind of helping young people, again, um, at any age, think about becoming shapers, designers, creatives who are building this stuff in new ways. And so, you know, one of the things that we do at the D School um, is that we have an undergraduate, um, a master's program, an electives program, as well as a whole professional learning arm. And I wanted to share our four pillars because I speak to the creative mindset around this first ability, which is the ability to make across mediums existing and emerging. As creatives, whether you're at Deloitte or someplace else, we need to be able to make with these new technologies in novel ways. Just like we all made with a pencil and pen, right? Existing technology, <laughs> uh, one of the simplest technology. We can also start making with AI. We can start making with gene editing. We can start making with blockchain. We can start making with quantum. I've seen beautiful quantum computing artist ex, um, installations. They're amazing. So how do we get to make with them? That's the role of being a designer or creative. The other piece um, is this capacity to care. You know, anyone who walks out of the D school classes, we want them to lead with this responsibility and stewardship toward people and the planet and the data we create. Again, the creative choices that we make as designer is around caring for people on the planet. So how do we do that? What does that look like in a classroom in our space? And then this other piece, which is this really human element, which is the, the capacity to uh, be flexible, adaptive learning. We know that like, as we all know in the beginning of this call, AI has changed rapidly. It will continue to change really quickly. And so how do we continue to have this adaptive stance? And I think for creatives on this call, that's a natural stance. That's kind of the world we live in to some extent is being adaptive. Uh, and so how do we continue to nurture that? And then the last one that probably is the most, I think unique to me and what I love the most is like, we actually want spark. What is that quirky, wildly creative, out of the box, you know, burning man style thing we're talking about here that really produces new ideas in the world. We want people to be doing things physical and digital that is quirky, that sparks something that's unique that you wouldn't necessarily see on mid journey, but represents the human spirit. So when I think about a creative and I think about AI and we think about it is not just, you know, augmenting it, it's actually bringing this sense of being a creative, the ability to make right, to care, to adapt and spark with AI, right, to make with these things and bringing them things together, not in isolation, not replacing us. So the other thing we do, um, you know, is we create a lot of resources. Um, we've been talking a lot about AI, and I think Robin gave good reminders, is like, we kind of misuse the terms like generative AI, Chat GPT, uh, we're talking about algorithms. Um, one of the areas that remember we think about this is like generative AI, right? Particularly Chat GPT is a large language model processing using pre trained data to create something new. Um, it also embeds algorithms. And so I'm putting in here one of the areas that we think if we really want to unbox some of this stuff, it's really helpful to understand what algorithms and how algorithms are influence our life. This is a creative effort. Um, and it's, I think algorithms around us, you know, they're on my Spotify, <laughs> they're on my Netflix queue, they're on my shopping queue at Target. Um, and so we create resources around this that are actually analog, that don't require coding. They're physical, that you start to make and prototype. So this, this game you'll see, and you can grab the QR code there. Again, it's free, it's downloadable. Um, you can play, it's a game. Cam might want to play this with his with the son, um, but it's like, what can I make with product? What can I make with an algorithm? Yeah, exactly. That's my big question for people thinking about how do we do something different than 
something different, not how we do the same thing differently. Yeah, exactly. So that's part of it is like, we need to move in that direction. That's the creative spark spirit. And I think part of it is not just like, what am I going to, what app am I going to create? But what's the, what are the implications? We actually did this exercise recently with some students from Brazil. And the challenge is quite simple. We're like, imagine the first day of university and play this game. And the data sets they looked at were looking at association or clustering, which is like, you know, how do ideas kind of fit together? I won't go into an algorithm lecture, but like some of it was dimension reductionality, like getting to the single data point. But the data set they were looking at is urban noise. How can you reimagine the first day of university using um, a dimension reductionality algorithm and noise? What does that look like? And how would you design that? That's the kind of funky space that you can play in when you start prototyping in lo-fi ways with algorithms. Because part of the learning here was quickly in design and creative space is you want to learn while making, while doing. You don't have to scale and get the thing. Part of it is actually learning early and often to understand what that making is. And then thinking through the implications. Um, we had some data sets that we played with this, which was like looking at celebrity faces, you know, and the students started prototyping with that. And then they realized, oh my gosh, this would be really bad because we would actually really offend a whole bunch of people if we use an association and then a celebrity data set that actually would be really bad for many people. So how do we play with that in the early stages? And again, thanks, Van, for dropping into this a resource there. Um, and then the last thing I'll just share here is like, you know, some of the classes that we teach. And um, I think Robin can throw those in, our, in the chat as well. But we actually teach a whole bunch of elective classes, Inventing the Future is one. Um, another one that's not listed here, which is my favorite, is called Forbidden Design, which is what are the areas that we're not teaching yet, like grief and marriage, psychedelics. What are areas that we're like not yet teaching about, the forbidden areas that we don't talk about? So that's a class. Um, my colleague, Ariam, teaches a class called Tinkering with Inequity in Emerging Tech. She brings in, um, she designed fashion, for example, recently using sustainable fashion materials and thinking about how you design and make with algae to create new materials for clothing. That's the kind of making thing that we start doing when we start thinking about emerging technology. And that's a huge trend and also has a sustainability element. And then of course, to Zeta and then designing machine learning, how can you actually understand and start designing with these things as creatives and designers? Um, and so I just want to share, this is like really, really short and brief um, because I'm giving you a high work. Now I want to go into like, just like three ways we're thinking about it at the D school. And I'm just going to share some examples as well as like things you can actually take and do and play with um, in this exercise. Cause I wasn't sure when we did a webinar, like I was telling Robin, I usually do big workshops. And so I'm just giving you some examples. You can take these and play with them. So I just want to show three examples of like, just some recent stuff we've been doing because we are still learning and playing. Um, so the question we asked, and I think you know Cam or someone else posted in the chat, um, is like, how are we using Gen AI to like really enhance our brainstorming skills? That's a thing a lot of people are doing. I've used it, um, any of us has, but I wanna show some strategies about how do you actually not just have a good question, but make that better, make that process a little bit better. And I just wanna share one example of what we've done um, with people when we've designed this exercise. Um, so the challenge that we gave folks recently was like alumni connections. That's Stanford campus. We had alumni weekend last weekend. All these folks come back. And I had folks, about 100 different alumni from every generation. I had a, a couple that had been married 61 years that were rolling into this thing with their phones, ready to take on AI. And they're ready to learn, which I love. And so we gave this standard connection is like, this question is like, how might we help alumni connect back to Stanford and the mission? That's a question from the University of Sydney. I know for Robin and Anna, that's a question all of us face at universities. So how do we do that? So we asked, we augmented with AI. And so we asked them um, to brainstorm ways, you know, alumni might connect with Stanford and contribute to the mission. But then we use a dot. We did some analog prototyping, paper and pen, and you can see the dot there, but we used an artificial teammate. And so we created uh, using Lambot, my colleague Leticia, who's been using bots right now, created a bot. You can actually play with it. It's still live. You can grab it and play right now if you want to. But we had it play and ask this question for us. 
as a way to teach how to brainstorm. We didn't go into ChatGPT, the actual thing, we created the bot with it. So it was much more focused and much more you know, direct. But then we did a couple ways of doing it. First is we asked the question, right? But then we started giving strategies. Yes, we asked the bot to give the thing, but then we said, okay, it came up with like 20 things. Now I want you to combine X and Y. I want you to lift up, you know, idea number two and make it more provocative, make it really funky and new, make it more sustainable. So we started giving it more refined questions so that we can get to better ideas. Oops, I can get over there. Um, we also started using constraints, right? As anyone know who's done any kind of good ideation or brainstorming, constraints are the magic muscle of brainstorming. Constraints help us get to better ideas. And so we had them look at like emerging technology, sustainability challenges. We had them look at intergenerational pieces. We started like really getting more deeper, giving those constraints. We had one is like, how might we use cats just to play with the concept of what that could look like? We had people now thinking about their ideas that came up, choosing one and start to plan out what might be the unintended consequences of these ideas? What might happen in 20 years if this idea were to become true and come to life or scale, as we like to say in scale, Silicon Valley, um, what might happen? What would happen in 2010 if this really launched? And particularly noticing again, consequences can be helpful or harmful, right? I use the term unintended because sometimes we assume they're harmful, but it may be great. But we have to think about these as designers. Just like I showed you on the thing, designing for implications is again, the single most thing we need to think about as design. And then lastly, um, we really had to take the next level. Um, I've done lots of things. We had a, we ended up having a rap battle that came up out of the, the design. We have songs that came up with a great that I think someone's gonna like pitch to someone. Um, we had op-ed and I've done scopes of work, but in this case we had this. And then for example, when I was prototyping for you all, like these are some of the ideas that came up with. And then I had them do an op-ed. I said, can you give me an op-ed of what that might look like about the idea? So I had them choose one. I had the bot choose one. And then I had it create a, an op-ed of like, if this idea were to come to life, what would that op-ed look like? to get to like more, again, the nuance, giving an idea that is like virtual reality to giving it flavor, right? To giving it, you know, real um, texture. And so brainstorming in ChatGPT is not just the one question, it's using our techniques around brainstorming, right? And constraints and things that we know to do well to get to the next level idea. We have to apply our own human strategies or perhaps our own biases or questions with the brainstorming. Right. Part of chat being using it to augment yourself is not just assuming it's going to come up with your ideas is like, how do you make with it using the questions and the spark that you have or the key questions? That's the key, I think, that we're using there. Um, so those are a few. I'm curious, again, how anyone in this space right now, I think Cam and someone else put, how are you using it right now to really enhance your own brainstorming or ideation? And of course, it's OK if you're not. Um, but I'd be curious. Again, I'm going to throw on some song. And uh, just here, just put in the chat again, what are you doing right now? Anyone else using it brainstorming? Just put your ideas in the chat because your ideas help everyone else. Supporting definitions to compile a glossary. That's a great one. Thanks, Helen. Anybody else? I'm not a teacher. I know wait time, so I can count it down. <laughs> All right, we'll keep going and we'll keep going as we go through. And I'm sure more people add some stuff in here. Um, so I also want to think about like this question of reflection. Thank you, Cam, for adding that down there. Um, so another way that we've been playing with another question, again, as you see, like we frame things as questions, not as just the answer. And so we've been playing with like, how might it enhance reflection? And so my colleague and I have been creating this, we have this, so she's created this bot, it's called Riff. It's a reflection bot. And again, you can grab it, you can use it right there. Um, but it's actually an AI powered reflection assistant that helps um, students and ask questions about your experience. 
I mean, I feel like this is an old John Dewey experiment, but like, remember, it's not the experience, but the reflection on the experience that makes the meaningful powerful. Allegedly, John Dewey said something like that. <laughs> the debate is real, whether he actually said it or not. But that's a key piece, right? Reflecting on it. And so what we've done here um, is we've created, and she's created this bot, and this is just the back end of it, but it actually like is a classroom tool. So we use it whenever we're now doing experiences live or in person where we actually ask, like this is where the teacher puts some stuff data in. And then you'll see, we blacked out some of the information, but we actually grabbed here in this picture, like you'll see the human responding and the, the bot or riff responding and actually trying to help understand what was meaningful for the students, what was powerful, what didn't work so that we can really dissect like why, for example, this improv activity, for example, really made sense or actually had an impact. If I were to do that in a classroom live, you know, my old exit slip, et cetera, I might get one answer and I might have, it might be a more transactional. I'll take one and get my response and I'll have to code in myself. But the bot allows the interaction, right? So we can do follow-up questions. So like in this example, right, what was the most valued? It actually gets to follow up about really diving deeper in. And again, as in the back end, we get to see all that data and play with that. So it pushes on like what reflection might look like. Yep. And thanks, Dan, for putting that out. You can train a persona and you can ask people to do that. You can train it. Um, I think I would have mine be like, you know, Pablo, Pablo Neruda, like bot or Esther Perel bot or all the things you can actually train it based on yourself, which is really cool. So there's ways to think about it. So Dan, thank you for putting some stuff in there. Curious from you all, and I'm getting to my end time here. How are you thinking about using reflection AI to generate, generative AI to enhance reflection? So anything, anybody doing anything interesting there that they'd like to share? Again, you can add your thoughts as we go. And then the last question that to me is probably the most crucial question that we think about within the D school is how might we help students understand the implications of generative AI? It's kind of what we've been talking about today, creation and reflection. And so one of the things that we created, which is not digital, it's analog, because I believe in the power of making analog, is that we created a student-facing magazine called Rep. Um, you can grab it there if you want to. There's an educator. Um, I think it's on Amazon. I don't know if it ships to Australia, but there is a digital, digital download that's for free and folks can grab it. Um, but like we really start getting into the definitions <laughs> because people think there's a bot. And they don't know what that is. And so like, let's talk about what a bot actually is so that we have level setting of what an actual bot is, right? And we're talking about voice bots, artificial intelligence, AI assistance. We actually did this pre-chat GPT, uh, not knowing that chat GPT was coming. And it actually was done in 2000, I think 2021 actually was done. And then, you know, bot came out. So we feel like it was apropos. Um, and then we talk about how, what it looks like. You know, what's transparent. It gets at the implications in this one, for example, it's actually a digital, you know, exercise student or physical exercise students can do about like, how are we designing this? What questions does it ask? What do we need to be asking? How does it ask those questions, right? Because the language model and the questions that respond are only as good as the language we put into it. And so if you're training it like a persona, we have to think about race, gender, culture, ethnicity. Those are the questions when you think about a bot that we know have negative implications if they're not done well. Um, and this is a big one, like going back to Hugh's voice, you know, this is part of the magazine is like helping students understand whose voice are we talking about? One of my colleagues who, um, who Aaron and I worked on this, um, her family's from Kenya. So every single time her mother pulls up the bot, uh, it doesn't work. It doesn't work because it doesn't understand her language, her diction. It doesn't work. And so how do you get better at knowing that these are design choices? They don't have to happen to you, you know? We also have them thinking about social attachment. I was talking to Robin and Anna early on the call and helping understand that chat GPT, the bots, the persona, there is a, and that goes out to replica. What is the social impact, um, social attachment theory that's connected to it? Are we assuming that these bots are people? What is the impact of that on our own humanity, our own questions? 
Um, does bot have humanhood, which is a thing that I see happening as well right now. That's a, a trend we're noticing. And then really thinking about this idea of privacy, you know, listening, reflecting. How do we protect our privacy and all of these things and our data? Because again, those are choices we get to make. And then understanding that like part of, you know, this technology trend is, is personal. And then we all bring our digital identities into our classroom situation, right? That is part of being a creative. We are humans, our identities, as well as our digital identities are part of the design work. And so how do we understand that? What do we think about perspective taking? Um, we designed this exercise. And again, this is a physical exercise. And it's really about perspective. And anyone who's an artist in here understands the value of perspective. When I draw a tree, for example, or consider a tree, whose perspective is it taking? A tree for myself is very different than what a bird might say or what the Maui people might say. So how are we taking those in considerations when we're designing these language models? And how do we get everyone to start thinking about this now not when it's been perpetuated, you know, 50 years out to Cam's point, it's the worst that it ever was. It probably is, but you're not, we need to be thinking about these things. I like this one perspective at the bottom, like a, a, a tree is really like a colony of ants. That is a perspective that is real. And we're for designing for people on the planet. That's an important perspective to take. <laughs> if we're thinking about how we design with the planet, understanding all the human life that impacts the planet is connected to perspective. And then looking at, for us, we think about, again, these really important issues of privacy, security, and ownership. These are creative questions. These are areas of design that we get to understand and understand the rules of this work. And then lastly, you know, one of the areas that we like to play with, and I'll, I'll just go back really because I went too fast, is like really making we make with, and one of the areas that we think is really important is having students make physical things. And so part of like our ethos on this magazine that we created was actually to have students make a manifesto, it, almost a collage of like their vision of what a bot is. And we worked with a artist um, named, named David Albo, who's actually out of Ghana to create a physical manifestation of what AI looked like or what bots look like. And you'll see in here, we actually have students make an art piece using what they think the visual representation of a bot or AI is getting to that creative space about like the fact that you actually can shape AI. It's not this ethereal thing. It actually is a physical manifestation of what that might look like. And how do you as a designer think about repair, representation, repower, um, all of these things that we need to be thinking about as designers. And so as we kind of close up, I'll just share like, when you're doing your work right now, how might you have students really making with generative AI, but also exploring the implications? You know, I'm, I'm looking at my colleague Cam on the phone is like making with your son and then thinking, is that important? Should we be making this? If I write this, what are the implications of that? How do we get students right now thinking about just because you can make it, should you? And then thinking through what we call the long-term implications, the first, second, and third order changes of making with AI. Again, these are not, these are policy questions, but they're all design questions and they're creative questions because as designers and makers and creatives, we actually get to think through these things. That's part of our job. And so thinking through the implications of our work. So as I shared, um, what's next for us? Uh, is we're taking on gene editing, for example. Um, we see that as a trend that's really happening really quickly. We all were kind of freaked out about um, AI and block, you know, that's coming really quickly. Gene editing is happening pretty quickly as well. And so the ability to read and write genes is a trend that's happening. We're seeing it moving. And again, that is another area of design. Blockchain, we're seeing not just for crypto, but the capacity to think about ledgers, um, in certificates, we're saying learningeconomy.io is creating transcripts or what they call NTTs, which is non-transferable um, transcripts, which is how do we get students to have um, basically recognition for work they do outside of formal schools. 
again, that in of itself, when we start moving in that space, that might blow up universities for ourselves, like Rob and Anna, is like the idea that you can get formal valid um, certificates for work that has nothing to do with the university. Again, that is a design question we all are wrestling with right now. And then the area that I'm most interested in right now is really trying to understand quantum computing the nonlinear kind of transgress that is happening. I don't quite understand it, but we're taking it on in addition to IoT as well. Um, so as we kind of roll out through the day, I, I'll see how we go. Again, this is a webinar, so we'll see. But I do believe in reflection. And so I have this like tiny ask of you all. Um, and then I will close up Robin with some questions as we go through. But I'd love to just see how people are feeling now as we close up the hour. And the prompt is around this session, around generative AI, I used to think X. Now I think this. And because of that, I will, or because of that X. Um, but I would love for you to think about, you know, what you thought about initially when we started talking about AI and what do you think now? So what I'm going to encourage you and, and everyone that's on the call, if you have, a, you know, something around you, um, I'm going to throw some music on again. And I would love to just if you see or hear your reflections or put your reflection in the chat. That would be great. And then I'll kick it to Robin to close out with some questions. Are you thinking of stars now? I think it's very usable for everyone because of that. You're fine. I love it. Uh, thanks, Robin. Used to. Uh, great. Cam didn't know where to start. I hope you have more now where you can start, I hope. <laughs> yeah, totally, Paul. It's only as good as we are. That's right. All right, I'm going to, um, oh, oh, we've got our David Bowie singing us, so I'm going to like another creative, if you will, uh, playing with us. So um, I think we're just going to wrap things up. Um, and again, feel free to keep adding your reflections in the chat. Um, I'll just share here, um, you know, as I said, you know, if you go here, we have a whole range of design. We're pretty passionate about design. And so I'm just sharing, um, we, for those who are interested there's a book called Creative Acts for Curious People. I'm looking at a lot of different types of educators who, whether you're starting a meeting and you want to be more creative, you're running a classroom. These are actually all resources on creativity. Like how do we navigate ambiguity as a creative? You know, how do we think about maps? Designing for social change. My colleague, Sam Seidel, did Creative Hustle, which is like, how do we think about our creative hustle? What does that look like? Um, experiments and reflection that's coming out this fall. So these are all available. You can grab them, um, you know, if you want to. And if you need something, please let me know. And then um, just another reminder is like, as I said, we do a lot of professional learning. We just wrapped a two-part webinar. So it's online completely on integrative design, uh, which is how do we think about systems, equity, and design when we're taking on big social challenges. So we have a slew of those. I think we're prototyping a class on Notion. For example, to how do we refine our craft of design through some coaching? Um, we've got some courses happening this year on futures and design. So thinking about world building and applied imagination and design, which I'm very excited by. Uh, so we're doing a lot of things like that. So feel free to stay in touch um, if you need anything. And I think that's it. Thank you. And uh, stay in touch. And that's my email right there. If you have any questions, happy to share any resources. And of course, this... Um, Happy to share this deck as a PDF if someone needs it as well. So they need the links. So I will stop sharing my screen and kick it over to Robin uh, to call it a day. Well, thank you so much, Laura. Um, it's it's been a wonderful session. I I um, certainly feel like putting my hand up for some professional <laughs> learning around so many of the things that you shared with us. Um, we do have you know, a little bit of time. Are you happy to take some of those questions? Yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah. of course. Um, Catherine, I wondered, you've got a lot of questions there, but I wondered if you would like to ask, perhaps um, start with one of them anyway. Um, yeah, I, I'm, I am curious about to what extent is our, our creatives, you know, contributing to the development of this? Um I would like to think that, here we go. I would like to think that it's not just IT people that are setting up the original, you know, big platforms that are out there. I can see from what you're saying that we can set up our own, we can train our own, perhaps smaller, more specific things for say a university or whatever else, and that's great. But in terms of what's happening out there for the big, bigger picture to, for, you know, millions of people, how much are, 
creatives and people that are qualified in thinking about how the human brain works, yep. getting the opportunity to mold that. That's my big I mean, question. And I, I think it's there's been missed opportunities. I'm being explicit, Catherine. I think one great example of that, for example, was some of the training data now. I, I was starking to Robin and, and Anna beforehand. The training data on ChatGPT is actually up to date. They're using current data. It was like 2021 when it first launched, and now it's more current. The piece that I find fascinating, particularly on visual images, for example. So Dolly, which is trained on, you know, mid-journey trained on images. As far as I know, and we can check the data source, like the idea of who owns that data, for example, the images was pretty open-ended. And I think what I, what I, and there was a big pushback, I think around the beginning of that stage because attribution one, right. And then also, do you have their permission to use the da that data? You know, what is publicly allowable to use? And I know like, you know, last year, two years ago, there was a big, big movement. And this is where like, I think emerging technologies are connected. So we're like, we saw a lot of creatives really pushing on and making sure they had NFTs right, which is a trustable source, if you will, on via blockchain for their artwork, because it wasn't getting recognized. And then it was actually, it was kind of the trickle down, like, is this really an Air Jordan? It was like, not really. You don't know what she's at. So like, what is real? And so you're seeing a massive pushback, I think, with a lot of creatives. One, I think on attribution, which is totally spot on, we should be doing that, right? And then the other question is like, what do we give them permission to? You know, I feel like I, you know, a lot of us, I think we sign off waivers right? All the time. I'm watching the Uber uh, Netflix series right now. And we sign off really without reading. And I think part of where I think you're going, which I am as well, is like, are we asking the right questions? Are we giving permission? And I'm noticing a trend, which is really interesting. And we're talking about privacy and data a little bit. And there are generations of young people I see who don't care about that. They're like, give my data. So we're seeing it's not just like either or, it's also generational of people expecting what level of privacy they have for their data. And people feel quite differently about that. Talk to a Gen Zer. I don't, you and I are like, okay, maybe not. Uh, young people are like, well, give my data, I don't care. So there's a really interesting gap there that I think we're continuing to see about like, what is data, what is private, what is not. I mean, I don't have the answer. These the, You're asking an existential question, right? <laughs> Which is like, why do we do that? I don't have the answer. But those, to me, those are the areas that I think as we go forward, like those are the questions we need to start thinking about around data. And this is partly why I put it on there on data security and ownership, because those are the design questions. And I think we've seen such the scale of some of this work happening so quickly with some or without some consideration. And as an educator like yourself, I, you know, whether any one of these companies are we looking at ment working with mental health professionals when we're designing these things and things like that? That to me, we have to go in that direction because I don't think the stuff is going any going anywhere, but I think the best designers and the good designers of this stuff need to do that. Yeah, and, and I think, you know, there's always been the history with art or whatever else of appropriation. It's always been there, um, yeah. just to what extent. And I think it's just made it um, a lot more... Uh, bumping up against it because it's just so more obvious that an image has been taken and used. You know, you can see it happen quite yeah. distinctly, whereas yeah. it's been a little bit foggier in the past. So anyway, that's an interesting thing about uh, privacy and copyright and all those issues. Um, but I'd, I'd really like to see more of the the generate or you know the creation of AI or the development of AI not not only in in how it affects us as creatives mm -hmm. but how we can influence it to yeah. affect how others use it the public use it right. not not just the impacts for us as creatives that's right. yeah and, and that I think that's right. another question as well that Absolutely. You know, it needs to be something that we can really influence that's right yeah. and I think you're addressing a real, thank you, Catherine, a really critical question. And we're seeing the evolution of AI policy popping up. The EU has an AI policy. I think the US is a little bit laggard. And part of what we're noticing, not surprising, and we talked about this early on the call, is like, we all need to understand it. We need to understand what algorithms are. We need to understand that this is a language model. We need to have, there's a baseline knowledge. And I think we have existed to some extent in some of our emerging tech world that like, this is this like black box. It's a, no one knows what's going on. And I don't know how the app works. There's been this like, feel, right, for many years. And I think we're getting to a stage where this is where I feel like everyone is a technologist. It doesn't mean if you're a maker of or a consumer of or policymaker, all of us need to be equipped with what it is, 
how it works, the core functionality of like how blockchain or whatever works so that we can ask better questions and demand to your point, better AI policy that protects us on these things. And you're talking about a systems question. And I feel like we're starting to see the looks of that. And I 100% agree is like, we all need to see ourselves as technologists, as creatives in that arena, that is going to help us. And I think we have a long way to go. Um, and we think about like the U.S. Congress and things like that of trying to understand these things. But I think part of our mission, to your point, is to create resources that are like level set that anyone can use. So like our I Love Algorithms thing is part of our ethos, to your point, is like, what are they? Can I understand them in a basic way so that we can ask better questions? And to your point, have better, more influence if we actually know the kind of questions we want to ask. Thanks for your question. Thank you, Catherine. That was great. Um, Paul, your your would you like to ask your question around evaluation? Hi, <laughs> lovely. Uh, why, why I'm going to put my stuff down so I can look at you. <laughs> um, yes, look, I'm really interested in as a um, as someone interested in in the arts and creativity and the and there's a new definition of creativity that's come out quite recently that's included intentionality. Yeah. And I'm not too sure how I think about that, but I think one of the things that doesn't frighten me about AI in terms of creativity is the fact that AI doesn't, and this is the question, because I hope my assumption is correct, yeah. that AI doesn't really know what it's doing. It just produces stuff. And until we as a human decides, yes, that's actually the good thing, yeah. it's actually not creative. So when we talk about worrying about um AI producing and um, creative works, all it does in my understanding is it's a big plagiarist. It takes everything, finds something, puts stuff together and goes, what do you think of this? And then you go, well, actually, no, that's not what I want. That's not, that doesn't fit the, you know, and the standard definition takes talks about um, being original, which is what AI can do, new, but appropriate. So it's us deciding whether that's the appropriate way or not. So it's it's little more than, and I'm, this is a you know taking it to the, the the extreme, like throwing paint at the at canvas randomly, and then you go, no, that's not it, and then throwing some more paint. What troubles me though is the idea that that um, when you talk about AI analyzing, if um, AI can analyze, can it yet evaluate? So can you ask it choose yeah. the most creative option or choose the most um, innovative or choose them cho choose the picture that um, is you know the most kind of original um, because what made me think that it's getting to that is the fact that you're talking about the um, the replicants not replicants oh, yeah, that's replicant. from yeah, that example, replica. yeah. In, so if yeah. I can ask a question I can say look I'm a, or, or even the ref the riff the reflecting thing if I can yeah. ask I can make a statement. If the AI can understand it and well and ask an intuitive question back, yeah. is it getting to the point now where I can say, um, uh, not only provide me with something, but, but yeah. provide me with something that is creative? Yeah. Can I mean, it I think evaluate? It, yeah. I mean, I don't know. And I think, and my question is, should it? Is the other question I would ask. Well, as well. I, no, I don't think it should, but I, I think that, that, that horse is long gone about what it should and shouldn't do. Well, I think and I think part is how you would, I think to your point, I think this is where at least, again, there are more smart people than me that are working on this, you know, I think to some extent. And I think when I think about like my own work as a designer to say it in that perspective, or at least my own point of view, I think I like your analogy of like, I'm going to make with this, I'm going to make something of this. I still feel like my job as an educator designer is to do the ultimate evaluation and see like, is that novel? That is, yeah. and I think that, and I think that to me is a crucial part of this. And I think that's where I think where we are working with it alongside of it versus it should be making decisions without us. I don't think that's a direction, partly because I don't know the bias. I don't know the data set. And so like there, that's a really important piece. And so I might have, and to some extent there's human error in my evaluation as well, right? Of course. Yeah. And so, but I do think when we start getting to that level of evaluation without the human input that, you know, and a lot of us who have graded or putting on assessment lens, if we will, like there's a human potential sometimes for like, I know that's not quite right, but you know what? <laughs> There's something interesting there that you can't quite understand, right? You can't quite see it yet. And that's where I think whether it's, and that's why, I mean, I even showed you the back end of our colleagues because you don't just not do that. You have to look at what was coming up so that you can actually yeah. have a better question with a student, et cetera, right? It can't replace you, 
it can help you might find, oh, I noticed that. Let me go talk to that student about that in particular. Yeah, yeah for sure. Yeah. Because uh, my, I mean, this is thing about asking young people, I've got four sons who are all creatives um, and they're artists and they're going, well, what's going to happen? And I'm going, well, you'll still have to decide how you yeah. use this tool to make something interesting. Totally. But what right. one of them said, and I think this is really interesting for us to think about, one of those the points was that chat GPT, chat GPT is at its worst. I actually think it's at its, oh, AI is at its best because everything that it produces is going back into the pool and it's kind yeah. of like a gene pool that's getting more and more inbred so that the, the work that it's producing is is going to be just re replicating more of what it used to, re what it replicated yesterday and replicating further. And so until we, because really it's it's only can call on the history of up until recently, could only call on the history of human creativity. Now it can call on the, the history of its own creativity that had no one actually paying it, no, no one at the wheel. It was just random. It's wild, right? It's, wild. it's like, it's an existential exponential question, right? It's yeah. like, it is absolutely mind boggling. And this is where, you know, going back to Catherine's point, this is where I think the more that we have conversations around this and our role we have to get better understanding the constraints that it can make and then yep. really deciding what are the what are the guardrails and where do we want to fit in with this i mean i think there's great use cases i think as i think it was cam was talking about working with his son of like yeah i've seen great cases where like there's a blank piece of paper how do i get unstuck that's a great yes. use case for young people like great that's like i think that's the scariest thing is like write an essay and here's the pay it's like yeah. oh, how do i do that so there's, you know, great examples of that. And then I think to your example, Paul, like part of which is why I think there's an opportunity to design with AI, because when we think about the creative aspect of aesthetics, we're getting at, right? We're getting yep. at tone, getting at impact. That is the nuance of the critical thinking that we're talking about, right? So yep. the, that we all need to like work with our people on, right? Whether it's like thinking about the play that Anna has happening soon, there's the human element piece that I think we cannot forget. And to some extent, it gives us the opportunity to really get clear, like, what are these things we really want to lean into? And that's why I think I started our session around the spark, the human piece yeah. that we have to have. I don't think that's going away, nor should it. Mm. Yeah. 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 Thank you. I yeah. think, sadly, we'll, we'll have to um, wind up, but I think there are so many other pathways we could pursue with you, Laura. Um, ah. So interesting and and um yeah, I'm my brain's certainly exploding with different possibilities. So thank you so much for today. Sure. Bill, you got my email. Please stay in touch. Um there's lots of resources and feel free to reach out and you know, whether it's the critical, I hey, how do I do this algorithm exercise to the existential ones that Paul and Catherine are raising, you know, uh happy to chat. So thank you so much. Yeah. And thank you, Anna, for setting it up as always. No and thank you, everyone, for joining us today for, for what I think has been um, such an interesting and exciting um, webinar. See you soon, I hope. Bye, thank everyone. Thank you all. Have a great day.